lot of uh, new opportunities uh, keep springing up and kind of coming to fruition, things that we were discussing and planning just a, a couple weeks ago are actually really taking some, some solid ground here in the state. Um, before we kick it over to Dr. Chan for a public health update, uh, just a little bit of data. Uh, somewhat, not, I wouldn't call it good news, but uh, better than, than some of the news we've had lately. Uh, this is where we're seeing some of our cases go across New England. So Vermont and New Hampshire are seeing our average case count drop over the last two weeks, which is great. Um, obviously the southern, some of these other states in Rhode Island and Connecticut still seeing uh, significant surges. Um, and again, as we go forward, um, you know, the, the case count data I still believe is going to get a little more inaccurate over time just because so many more folks are going to be doing testing in the home, which makes, again, the data a little less accurate, but the ability to uh, push back on the transmission of the virus a little better because folks are going to be finding out a little faster with a little more convenience about whether they're positive or negative. And overall, that's a, that's a very positive uh, ebb, if you will, into the system, especially as we hit this winter surge. So uh, we're doing well. We Again, we monitor day by day, but over the past couple of weeks, we seem to have kind of hit a bit of a plateau. We still may see a spike after the holidays. Uh, I suspect that we will. But it's nice to know that we're not skyrocketing on that uh, asymptotic uh, pace that we we're at uh, just a, about a month ago. Uh, and hospitalizations, obviously, uh, one of the most important pieces of data that we have just in terms of where we are and the burden upon the healthcare system itself. Um, you kind of had this kind of early fall surge, and then this is really our winter surge with hospitals. Uh, really doubling in just about the past month. Uh, but over the past 10 days or so, we're seeing kind of a plateauing, even a slight downward trend. This can spike up at any moment, of course. But again, we're not kind of in this type of phase. Uh, keep going up. We seem to have kind of hit um, a, a bit of a peak here, and hopefully it's on a downswing. But again, we won't really know for, for a little bit of time. I still suspect that uh, after the holidays, we may see uh, a you know, somewhat of an increase in both cases and potential hospitalizations, which is why we're so adamant that folks just be careful. You know, we're not here to be the Grinch and tell folks not to meet with family or anything like that. We want people to have a, a happy holiday with family. Just do it safe. Be smart. Uh, have an understanding of who you might be with and some of the susceptibilities or underlying conditions of family members and friends that you may be gathering with or elderly parents or whatever it might be. So just we just ask folks to, to be smart about it, uh, maintain social distancing or use a mask where you think it's appropriate, and, uh, and hopefully we can keep seeing this downward trend in both the hospitalizations, fatalities, and cases, uh, not just across New Hampshire, but across New England. Um, unfortunately, you're seeing a lot of real spikes in, in other states, mid-Atlantic states, some other Midwestern states. Um, those case numbers are really starting to skyrocket. They're kind of where we were just a few weeks ago, unfortunately. So, um, you know, uh, the, uh, we'll talk a little bit about, you know, the president's speech yesterday and some of the tools and resources that we're seeing out of the federal government um, in just a bit. But before we get too far down that path, I'll ask Dr. Chan to come up and give us a public health update. Thank you and good afternoon. Uh, so some numbers for today. Uh, we are reporting 900, 983 new people diagnosed with COVID-19 in the state. We continue to average uh, just over 1,000 new infections per day. And the number of people with active or current infection is 8,495. Our test positivity rate continues to hover around 12%. And as the governor showed in the graph uh, just a, a minute ago, hospitalizations have decreased, but there continue to be about 400 people hospitalized um, statewide with COVID-19. Um, 400 people hospitalized right now with uh, COVID-19. And then unfortunately, seven new deaths um, from COVID-19 to report today, bringing the total number of deaths to 1,875 um, people that have died from COVID-19 during the pandemic. Two of these new deaths are in people associated with a long-term care facility, but the majority of deaths that we are seeing continue to be um, community-based uh, deaths. Um, we are watching very closely what's happening with uh, the Omicron variant. Um, and as I'm sure people are aware, the, there are increasing um, infections with the Omicron variant across the country. Um, we continue to see the majority of infections here in New Hampshire with the Delta variant. Um, in the last week, we have identified six new infections due to Omicron. Uh, and so our data dashboard uh, tonight will be updated, uh, showing a total of nine total identifications of uh, the Omicron infection. Certainly this is expected to be an underestimation of all the Omicron that's out there, but the vast majority of infections that we are seeing here in New Hampshire continue to be with the Delta variant. Um, 
<clears throat> this also stresses the um, importance of um, people getting vaccinated uh, before the Omicron variant becomes more widely circulating. Uh, everybody five years of age and older should seek out vaccination, and everybody 16 years of, of age and older um, who has already completed a primary series should get a booster dose. The booster dose particularly continues to be important, especially as we see the Omicron variant um, emerge across the country and in New Hampshire. Um, and then finally, in addition to vaccination, as the governor mentioned, it's important for people to also continue to, to continue to take other steps over the holiday season as they're gathering with people. It's important for people to uh, stay at home and not gather publicly. If they're having symptoms of COVID-19, they should seek out testing. Um, for people that uh, are um, thinking about attending family gatherings, uh, testing is a good strategy. Um, but testing before attending family gatherings is important uh, to identify infection early and before introducing it into groups of people. And then if people have high risk exposures, either through travel or through gatherings, um, getting tested after return from travel or after return from a, a family or group gathering is also important. And in that uh, setting, we recommend testing, you know, five to seven days after a potential um, exposure. And then finally, we continue to recommend that people keep gatherings uh, small. And as the governor mentioned, just be aware of uh, the settings that you're walking into and take the necessary precautions. We continue to advocate for a um, layered prevention strategy. Um, and while that starts with vaccination and vaccination continues to be the most important tool that we have uh, it, it is important for people to also continue to take other steps to protect themselves and family and friends. And with that, I will hand things to the commissioner. Thanks. Good afternoon. Uh, Long-term care update. We're holding pretty steady. We've closed three outbreaks since our last press conference. We are opening t three new outbreaks. So steady at 25 outbreaks uh, for the state of New Hampshire. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Dr. Chan. A um, few different things to talk about, specifically about some of what we heard yesterday uh, from the White House and the federal government in terms of opportunity. Um, uh, we'll just start off talking a bit about the President's remarks. Um, as part of his announcement yesterday, um, the President stated that the federal emergency response teams would be deployed to several states, one of them being New Hampshire. So that uh, that was great news. And while we appreciate the federal government's support, uh, just we wanted to be clear for everyone, we have yet to receive confirmation that any new teams uh, will be br uh, brought to the state of New Hampshire. It still, hopefully, uh, will happen, but we just wanted to make sure we were clear that we hadn't uh, heard of any new teams announced uh, beyond the ones that were I requested uh, to FEMA a few weeks ago and uh, have already hit the ground here and have been doing a fantastic job, by the way. Um, they sent, uh, FEMA did send a medical team to Elliott Hospital just a few weeks ago. They've been a huge, fo a huge help. I want to take a moment to thank them, very valuable partners. Uh, unfortunately, tomorrow is uh, their last day, uh, and we haven't received any indication that, that that deployment will be extended. So maybe it's possible we'll get another team based on what the President announced yesterday, but right now the, um, that isn't uh, the case. We'll, we will keep advocating. Um, what we did hear, though, on a positive side, um, we were sent 30 paramedics to New Hampshire. Uh, they were dispatched to the, our hardest hit hospitals. Um, they were supposed to be here uh, for about another nine days through New Year's. And now we've heard that they will be, their deployment will be extended another couple of weeks. And uh, again, that's very, very helpful um, uh, just to know that they will be here. And the fact that they're going to be here working through the Christmas holiday. Uh, these are folks that are, for the most part, away from their families, um, from other states. Uh, and again, we just can't thank them enough enough for being on the ground here to help uh, specifically our hospitals and our emergency rooms, uh, keeping folks moving forward, keeping that, that flow of patients coming through. Uh, they've been very valuable and they'll be on the ground for uh, two weeks beyond, uh, so probably about another three weeks in total, which is really, really great news. Um, and we're still advocating, we're hoping we'll still get a team in to help administer monoclonal antibodies. We don't have confirmation on that just yet, um, but we're going to keep advocating for that. We have, have received more monoclonal antibodies to the state, that's great. What we're looking for is the staff and some of the, the folks that can help administer that treatment. Um, it can be a little bit time sensitive. Um, it can, it can uh, take up a lot of time and we want to make sure that a lot of our nurses and doctors are on the front lines and any help we can get in terms of deploying those monoclonal antibodies early on in uh, an individual who is symptomatic can very much help keep them out of the hospital. So it's a big tool uh, and we're very appreciative of that. So we'll, we'll see if we can get a team up here to help administer. Um, uh, testing. Oh, that's another big one. So 
You know, the, the Biden administration was very uh, reluctant, and I, I, and I would in some senses say resistant, to the concept of home testing. Uh, as a lot of folks know, we were the first state in the country to really make a, a, a very large amount of home testing directly available to our citizens a couple weeks ago. We put out about just about a million tests. Uh, they were taken up in literally about a day, uh, which was great. It really showed that the demand was there. I think a lot of pro our people appreciated how easy the program was. They clicked a button, and two days later, Amazon was dropping tests off right at their doorstep. Um, clearly, what uh, New Hampshire did was a we were a, a a very good example. The system worked very, very well, and it's. Uh, I'm very excited to see the Biden administration has uh, changed course, and the president announced 500 million home tests uh, are they're now promoting to be released sometime in January. Um, so for the other 49 states who I think who are watching what we did, wondering how we did it, um, it was great to see that Washington kind of saw our success, and and they'll hopefully they'll be able to replicate that for the other 49 states that are out there. Um, in the meantime, we are already going on to uh, phase two, if you will, of our Say Yes to the Test program. So tomorrow morning, starting tomorrow, any households that did not receive one of the first million tests that were available online will have uh, another shot. Uh, we're going to do a second round of Say Yes to the Test. Um, I believe it's about 750,000. Is that right? I just want to make sure I get that number right. 750,000 tests will become available to New Hampshire residents, again, who did not already get one as part of the first round because we want to make sure we're, um, you know, making sure as many families can participate uh, in that program as possible. Uh, so that will become available tomorrow. You just go on the nh.gov backslash COVID-19 uh, website. Um, so we're, we're estimating about another 180,000 households uh, will be able to click on and get um, a, a, a bunch of these tests because they don't just send one, they, they send a few, um, which is really, really great. So uh, nh.gov backslash COVID-19 tomorrow. Um, I believe the tests will be sent out just after Christmas on December 27th, I believe. They'll get sent out uh, and hopefully folks will be able to get them even right before the new year. It just takes a couple days usually for the test to be, to be mailed out. So that will be available tomorrow and we encourage everyone to go on to the um, nh.gov website and uh, say yes to the test. Click, click on it and uh, you'll be able to hold on to them. They don't really expire, at least for a long amount of time, so you'll be able to have them for yourself, your kids, your coworkers, whatever you, you might need um, in the coming months. Um, switching gears a little bit to the Executive Council, earlier this morning the Executive Council did vote to approve another $55 million in requests from uh, my offices uh, to respond to the pandemic. Um, they're critical, critical funds. They can help us uh, really immediately. One of the bigger items in there are, are, are new vaccination sites, six new fixed vaccination sites that will administer booster and vaccines on a walk-in basis, so you don't even need an appointment. The four fixed sites that we have currently uh, have been very, very successful. They're also walk-in. You don't need an appointment. So if people are concerned, well, I can't get an appointment for a booster for weeks and weeks out or whatever it might be, you can literally show up at, at some of these sites first thing tomorrow morning and, uh, and get a vaccine or get a booster. It's right there for you. We're going to put another six sites out there in Manchester, Nashua, Concord, Keene, Salem, and Exeter. Uh, and that uh, we're also doubling our fixed texting sites testing sites, adding locations in, again, Keene, Laconia, um, and Lincoln, and the, another one in the Berlin-Gorham area. So a lot of opportunity. Just go onto our website, and you can see exactly where all of these fixed sites are, um, and that's where you can get all the information to be able to just walk right in um, and, get a, uh, and get a booster, which is, which is really great. Um, in terms of adding more beds, you know, uh, kind of a little bit of an update that we provided last week to, the, to decreasing the jam on beds uh, in our hospitals. Uh, since December 8th, just a, over a week ago, uh, we've already moved four, 40 individuals uh, from emergency room and hospital beds to long-term care facilities that, and, and nursing homes, so that's freeing up beds uh, in our, the, kind of the heart of our health care system where we re really need it the most, and we'll keep working on that program. But so far, that's been a big success in terms of uh, flexing open our opportunities. Um, and then finally, or I, yeah, really finally, there's really one, one more thing, is Booster Blitz 2.0. Another great program. The Booster Blitz was wonderfully successful uh, just about a week and a half ago. So we're doing it again. On, on January 8th, we'll be doing Booster Blitz 2.0. Sign-ups for this next round of boosters, and this is not a walk-in. This is sign-ups required for this one. We're looking to put out about 13,000 
um, appointments, open up 13,000 appointments across 14 different state-run sites on Jan Saturday, January 8th. Um, Sign-ups for this next round of boosters is going to open on January 3rd. So if you check back to the, our, our website on January 3rd, you'll be able to sign up as part of Booster Blitz 2.0. Uh, you can see the 14 different state-run sites. Most of the lo locations will be the same, um, but you should definitely check in. A few venues may change just based on capacity and availability. Um, for example, the Stratum location is going to be moved to more of an uh, Exeter-centric location um, just to help with uh, a higher throughput. Um, so uh, nh.gov backslash COVID-19 and just kick on, click on the button that says Booster Blitz and that'll open up all the opportunities. You can see where the sites are and register the, for the boosters. And again, that's just boosters, not to state the obvious with the title. And that's not for uh, people getting their first or second shot of the vaccine. That's just boosters on January 3rd. Um, and again, if you're looking for a booster today, you don't have to wait till January 3rd or January 8th. You can literally walk into any one of the, the fixed sites and, um, um, you know, first thing tomorrow morning, if you'd like, and, and get a booster. So we're trying to make everything as easily as easy to access and available as we possibly can. Um, the last thing, uh, real, real quick, is uh, the CARES Act. So if you remember way back, and back in March of 2020, uh, one of the first things that uh, Congress uh, did, which was very helpful, was release a lot of money in CARES Act funding. We talked a lot about CARES Act programs and opportunities last year. We did find out late last week, the program was really set to end uh, in two weeks, but we found out very late last week that there is a slight extension on the program, which is opening up some opportunity. So long story short, we're going to be allocating another $10 million of CARES Act funds to hospitals based on their bed count. Again, just to allow hospitals to uh, react to the COVID pandemic, have some flexibility. Uh, they can invest it, whether it's in their nurses or their doctors or equipment, whatever they really need to to address the um, COVID issue uh, within their system. About but $10 million in grants uh, will go out to hospitals. I think all hospitals will get something based on their bed count. So it's a nice even and fair formula uh, to support the COVID response and the continued COVID surge. Uh, a few other programs in there that we're able to reallocate money to uh, at the very last minute. But um, uh, that little bit of flexibility that the federal government gave us really allows us to reallocate some of the I'll call it unused funds and untapped funds at the last minute, and specifically to hospitals, uh, which is obviously where a lot of the need is today. Okay, I know that's a lot. Uh, we can open up for, for questions. Governor, as far as um, at-home testing, as you said, case numbers won't be as reliable as they were before because of that. Um, how are we measuring the level of the virus in our community? Is it through the number of hospitalization, hospitalizations and beds, or how, how are we going to know? I think one of the best uh, metrics is through hospitalizations because it's not just about transmission. Transmission in the community, you have to get a handle on it. And the case, the, the, the viral case uh, data won't be completely useless by any means, but I, my sense is there's just going to be a lot of positive and negative results that just aren't going to necessarily be reported to the state or even the federal government with all the home testing going on. So um, what I look at primarily is the hospitalizations. The, I go back to what we talked about back in March of 2020. This is all about making sure the healthcare system doesn't get overloaded, and that's really the, the primary metric we use. And um, you can look at how Delta is a little bit different than the Alpha variant back in 2020 in terms of the number of individuals that might that are actively have COVID versus the number of individuals that are in a hospital versus the number of, of um, un unfortunately, the, the fatality rate uh, of COVID. Um, so those rates have dropped, which is great. I'm not quite sure what, what Omicron is going to bring. I was on the phone with Dr. Fauci and a lot of other governors yesterday talking about Omicron. What it really meant, was it more dangerous? Where were the, the sensitivities and, and where could our potential vulnerabilities be with this new variant? Um, it's still a bit unknown because it's so early on. We do know that, or at least have a sense that a lot of the monoclonal antibodies may not work on um, the current ones uh, that, we, that we mostly use, might not work on the Omicron variant as well um, as it did with Delta. Um, but there are other monoclonal antibodies that we can have access to, and, and we've requested those through FEMA to be a little more, that, that will work hopefully a little stronger against Omicron. But it's still uh, remain to be seen, maybe more of a question for Dr. Chan in terms, will it give you more severe symptoms? Is it more contagious? Still a little bit unknown there. Um, but right now it's really about making sure that we're prepared for whatever it might be. And I think that's what everyone's really gearing up for. Clearly, it's, you know, Omicron is going very, very aggressively through the rest of the country with about 75, I, I think the number they reported was about 75% 
of current cases uh, as of yesterday were Omicron across the country. Not as much in New Hampshire, which is kind of interesting, um, but we're, we're monitoring it and we have no doubt it's, it's already here in, in pretty aggressive form. We have nine cases confirmed, but I think over the next you know, week or so, we're gonna see that number really skyrocket. So, um, you know, watch for, for me, it's really about watching the hospitals, making sure that nurses and doctors have the resources they need and they're not getting uh, overtaxed. And that really comes with these additional teams that we've been requesting. Just a quick follow-up, as far as the at-home tests, we have heard from people who have tested negative multiple times on those, but positive on the PCR. Do you know if we can get an explanation as to why that may be? Well, again, the, the, the Binex tests are, are fairly accurate, but they're not nearly as accurate as a PCR. We've always known that, we've always talked about that. So um, if folks have any doubts about the test, if they're symptomatic and have any doubts, by all means, we recommend that they go in uh, and get a PCR test. But it's, that's unfortunately nothing new. They're still good tests to have, especially if you're symptomatic and positive. Um, usually, I, th I wanna say it's, uh, about an 85% accuracy rate? I'm, uh, maybe 70. 70, if you're symptomatic and positive? Yeah, so it's about a 70% accuracy rate, so it's, it's a good bellwether. If you, don't, if you don't trust it, you can get a second test or go for that PCR test. But that, that accuracy number hasn't really moved, I don't believe. Um, it's always been uh, about there, you know, when we're talking about those Binex tests or some of those rapid tests that we deploy. Is that concerning to you, just now that we're providing those with so many? To so many people. No, it's still an opportunity to have a sense of where you are, to be sure. I mean, it, I mean, any any potential test, even if it's only 70% accurate, is still a good thing to know, and it's still uh, helping a lot of folks pre-identify, not pre, but identify early on that they may have, you know, the COVID. What's, you know. what's the difference there? Is it the viral load, Dr. Chan? Oh, I'll ask Dr. Chan like to talk about that. So, yeah. What might be the difference there? Yeah, so, so difference between antigen tests and PCR tests, right? I, I mean, antigen tests are not a new type of test technology, right? There's, there's always a difference, always has been a difference um, in accuracy between PCR-based tests, which um, detect the actual genetic material of the virus itself, compared to the antigen tests, which are really looking for the proteins of the virus. You, you know, this, the same issue comes up um, every year with influenza testing, right? Influenza is a different virus, but we still have the same type of testing technology um, where the antigen tests are, you know, have a lower accuracy compared to the PCR test. So th this is a known limitation. Um, and so the, the question is um, really around testing strategy and how to use the available tests that we have um, to prevent spread of COVID-19. And there's a role for both types of tests, right? We've always said that PCR tests are more accurate um, are, more, are more accurate than antigen tests, but antigen tests are better than no test, right? And so it really comes down to um, an issue of uh, sort of a, it really comes down to clinical decision making first off, but, but also an issue of accessibility. And so if, if somebody can't access a PCR-based test, then we wanna make the at-home antigen tests um, readily available so that people can much more quickly identify infection if they have it so that they can isolate and prevent spread to other people. Um, you know, this gets a little bit confusing because um, we the, there are differences in accuracy depending on whether somebody is symptomatic or or not symptomatic. Um, when somebody is having symptoms of COVID-19, we've we've always said that either test is appropriate. Um, when you're talking about screening testing, you know, testing somebody that is not having symptoms of COVID-19, we've always expressed a preference for the PCR test over the antigen test. But again. Um, you know, an antigen test is better than no test. So, you know, it depends on someone's situation, whether they're having symptoms or not, but the, the testing is um, available and it's, it's more important to make the testing available than to not do a test at all, for example. What's the, what's the most important thing that people should know about the Omicron variant and COVID-19 right now from your perspective? Um, I, I think it goes back to what we've um, talked about the last few weeks is that uh, we believe the Omicron variant is more infectious going to be more easily spread um, and and we can make this determination based on what's happening in other countries like the United Kingdom what's happening in other parts of the US that are seeing dramatic spikes uh, increases in, in Omicron even overtaking the Delta variant um, so it, it's it's important um, 
for people to also recognize that the vaccine is going to be less effective at preventing infection, um, which is why we've been recommending a booster dose, right? It's, it's being shown more clearly through this emerging studies that a booster dose is going to be more important against the Omicron variant than against some of the past variants in terms of boosting antibody levels, boosting vaccine um, effectiveness. So th there's sort of two things there. One is get a booster dose um, because we believe that's going to be important for preventing um, infection and severe outcomes from the Omicron variant infection. Um, but also as we see the numbers um, start to rise in other parts of the globe and other parts of the U.S., um, it sort of stresses also or, or it stresses the importance also of people not, um, not just relying on the vaccine when we have such high levels of COVID-19, but also taking other steps to prevent spread between people. Should, uh, should people be gathering with extended family and going to Christmas Eve parties and, and, and things like that? And if they do, should they be wearing a mask? Should they be opening the window? What do you say to those people? Yeah, so I think it goes back to the, the multi-layered multi approach that we've been recommending all along. Um, we, we do want people to be able to gather with family and friends this holiday season. Um, I, I, I believe it can be done safely and with uh, the appropriate layers of protection, it can minimize the risk of spread of COVID-19. But it is important, especially over the holidays, for people to, to get together. And so again, it starts with vaccination, it starts with getting a booster dose, um, but we do recommend that people keep group gatherings small. Uh, we do recommend that people do not attend group gatherings or you know, gather with other people if they're having symptoms of COVID-19. Those individuals should stay home and get tested. Um, ventilation, you mentioned, uh, is important. You know, If you're gathering indoors, look for ways to increase ventilation. That could be cracking the windows open. That could be turning on the ventilation fans in the kitchen and the bathroom, for example. There's actually a lot of um, guidance on the CDC website for how to increase ventilation in a home. Um, and then it comes back again to, to testing, right? I think there are um, a lot of scenarios where testing can be employed um, as an important mitigation measure, um, both testing if somebody's symptomatic and staying home, um, testing before uh, a group gathering to screen for infection, even if somebody's asymptomatic, and that's where at-home antigen testing can come in handy. Um, and then testing after a potential exposure. So if people are, are gathering, if they're traveling, if they're gathering together, um, th if there may have been exposure um, at an event, we do recommend testing about five to seven days after a possible exposure. So there's multiple scenarios where testing comes into play, which is why making testing more available is, is an important strategy to um, control spread of COVID-19. And then finally, regarding masks, you asked about masks. Um, that's going to depend up to uh, de depend upon individual circumstances. Certainly, if people want the extra layer of protection, um, you, you know, especially if you're going into larger group gatherings, then you know, face masks um, may be an important mitigation strategy. We spoke to a uh, ICU doctor today who mentioned, you know, this year was supposed to be better. Vaccines are here, and that was something we were all looking forward to. The doctor said that it's actually worse now. Um, with Christmas and the new variant, is it too late to slow it down now within the next couple weeks here? So, so we know how to control spread of this virus, um, right? So I, I wouldn't say it's ever too late to control spread. I mean, we're seeing some of the highest levels of COVID-19 in our communities that we've seen at any point during the pandemic. Um, certainly if, if we didn't have the 65 percent plus of the population fully vaccinated, hospitalizations would be higher, deaths would be higher. Um, so vaccines are having an effect, we believe, but um, there's, still, there's still work to be done getting people vaccinated, certainly getting people booster doses, um, and we know how to control spread of this virus, so it's never too late for people to take those, those steps that I just talked about to you know, slow the spread between people and between communities. And just, just one more. Um Elliott Hospital, uh, we received confirmation today that there's a refrigerator truck outside in case they need it. Um, just with your background and all the work that you've done in the last couple of years, just your reaction to that, that, that we're at this point. So, so I haven't I haven't heard that report, um, but certainly any time we see such, I, I assume you're talking about a, a, a refrigerator truck, truck for dealing with the deceased. Yeah, for by, if they need it. Yeah. Um, that is not something that I've heard hospitals having to employ, but certainly we saw that earlier in the pandemic um, when levels of COVID-19 reached very high levels, when hospitalizations and deaths were, were very high. 
that's something we want to prevent. Uh, it is preventable with vaccination um, and with, with stress, again, the importance of people getting vaccinated to prevent those kind of unfortunate outcomes. And, and Governor Sununu, if I could ask for your reaction to that too, given where we are at this point. Um, yeah, so we, that, that was the case early on. Um, there's a lot of precautionary measures that hospitals will take, especially during the winter months. Uh, and as we're seeing the surge, so I don't know if the commission wants to add anything to that, but it's nothing out of, uh, you know, it's a very, scary precautionary measure, but an appropriate one um, as, as a kind of a just-in-case. Um, we're not out of the woods out on this thing at all. You know, we've seen our case numbers and our hospitalizations seem to have, you know, maybe maybe they're peaking, maybe they're not, who knows, but I think a lot of the hospitals are, are dealing with a lot and they, they're going to be prepared. Along with that, what would your message be to the public about where we are with the severity of COVID-19 right now in New Hampshire? <laughs> we're in the, the, the peak of the winter surge, the peak of what we've been warning folks about. Uh, was going to come since last August. Um, that's why the team has worked so hard over the past few months preparing, getting ready, implement, implementing new ideas, working with hospitals, not just in the past few weeks, but over months and months, so that um, we, we can be as prepared as possible. That doesn't mean that it, the surge becomes an easy process. We always knew this was going to be uh, very challenging for a lot of folks on a, a lot of different levels. We're getting a little bit of support for out of Washington, which is good. Um, you know, more support would be better, and, and we're hoping to see maybe some of these more teams and more help come. Um, you know, our hospitalization, as tough as it is, isn't near. It's not near the top right now at all in the country. Um, so there are states that are a little harder hit than us. There are states that I think Washington is seeing a higher priority, and that's where you're seeing some of those teams out of out of D.C. Uh, move to first, and that's fine. Everyone everyone has issues, you know, to be to be sure. But my job is to be as selfish as I possibly can for the state of New Hampshire and constantly advocate uh, and try to push as many resources, uh, not just out of Washington, but out of the state as we can to, to implement on the plans that we've been putting together. I have a question about the level of um, capacity at the fixed site locations. I think this might be for the commissioner. Um, Mike's observation has been at the very beginning when these fixed sites opened, they had very long lines with long waiting periods. I went yesterday mm -hmm. to another site, same site I went to, and there was no wait at all. Is there a way on the website to let people know that this is a good time to go out and get one if they had a very bad experience, or is there, what do you guys see? No, there's really no way to, to predict what a, the uh, rush onto one of the fixed sites might be on any given day or any given time. Obviously, I think some of the, you know, midday, you're not going to see as high of a level. Early in the morning, you're going to see a lot of folks. Um, and when some of the when some of the new fixed sites open up, I think there's a, there was a big rush to them. So, um, we've looked at that about how to kind of uh, kind of predict a little bit about what the capacity of some of those fixed sites might be. But they've been very successful. Their walk up. We don't want to burden people. This is a way to not burden people with the the demands of of setting a schedule. For some people, making an appointment is much better. They want a much more fixed time, uh, so they they know they can go with a, a pharmacy or their doctor to make sure that they're getting it. A lot of other folks have a little more flexibility so they can take advantage of this. But there's no real way to predict it. Um, our job is to open up more sites, right? Mm -hmm. So that hopefully none of them are, are too overloaded, but all of them are, are maximizing their ability to get the booster out. Do we know how many um, went last week, for example, to the fixed sites? Do we have a number on vaccination? No, we don't. We could, maybe, we could maybe look at that for you. We could try to get that information. I don't know exactly. I think there were four fixed sites. Each one could do about 375 uh, doses a day. So, um, you know, we can see exactly how many actually, how many folks actually took, took care of that. But I can tell you when we put these new sites in, we're putting six more sites out there. That's really being done based on demand where we can get the high, where we think we can get the highest throughput and the easiest uh, process to access folks. So, you know, you need, you have to think about everything from parking to, you know, the logistics around uh, individual locations and hopefully maximize those locations with where the need will be the highest. And finally, um, a question about hospital capacity. Um, 40 new beds basically have been freed up by this initiative. Um, what would sort of be the goal um, for you guys to get um, to um, with this effort? Or what, what do you think is the maximum? Specifically with the long-term care effort? Yeah. Well, as many as many folks as we can get out as possible. Um, so, I mean, what's really what really happens is you have individuals that are ultimately waiting in a hospital bed for a long-term care bed. We want to make that wait down to zero. 
right? As soon as someone a bed, as soon as they the need is there, we want the availability to be there. Um, I don't know if we'll ever actually get to that goal. So there's not like a, a specific number, but it's just about making sure that that aspect of hospitalizations and bed capacity, that throughput is really moving. Um, you know, when you look at, there's so many aspects to uh, bed capacity. Um, everything from length of stay, we've talked last week, we discussed a little bit how, you know, the average person in the ICU for COVID might be there for five weeks where the average person with a triple bypass is only there for five days. So, you know, that's that one individual is really taking up the equivalent of, of seven or eight beds, right? That one COVID bed is worth seven or eight beds for non-COVID issues because it can be turned over that many more times. So that's why we have such a compounding problem. Every, every additional COVID taken bed, um, it creates a, a more of an exponential problem for the system as a whole, which is why throughput is so important. Uh, we don't want people waiting in emergency rooms for, um, uh, I, to, for example, if individuals need to be IEA'd, we're trying to get those moved forward. If there are behavioral and mental health issues, if there's long-term care needs, we're trying to get those folks moved forward. Um, if there's folks with COVID but don't need a full overnight stay or maybe just need a one, one day and then can be moved out for better monitoring at home, that can be done safely with their doctor. Um, all these different aspects are, are moving people through. Um, so it's working. It's working. And we're getting there. Governor, do you have any sense of the vaccination rate among children 5 to 11? <coughs> I guess given we just first had a pediatric death in this state, um, do you hope that will lead more parents to have younger kids vaccinated than there are right now? Well, I just hope more parents vaccinate their kids. I mean, for because of what we saw with the data. The data is real. Um, the uh, the fact that more younger individuals are getting more severe symptoms of COVID, both hospitalization and otherwise, is a, an absolute fact of the Delta variant, um, could become a fact of the Omicron variant. And so we want people to be very cognizant of that, uh, take it very seriously, and hopefully make, make the right decision. In terms of the percent of folks, of kids that are vaccinated, um, do you know, Dr. Chen? Maybe Dr. Chen has some information. So, so, so the data that we have on vaccination percents comes off of the CDC website, and currently, there, um, CDC, the CDC website is listing um, almost 25,000 children, five to 11 years of age, that have been vaccinated, which represents about 25 percent um, of that five to 11 year old population. That's that's having received at least one dose of the COVID-19 vaccine. Right, we're obviously still in the process of starting kids in their vaccination series and then completing the vaccination series, but that uh, approximately 25,000 children um, is, uh, are the number that have received at least one COVID-19 dose. Thanks. You know, I'll just, I'll just add for what it's worth. You know, we, we did find out this week, we really had our first young child death um, from complications due to COVID. And, and I think that hits home with a lot of folks. Obviously our, our, our thoughts and hearts go out to the family. I can't imagine what that family uh, is going through, um, you know, finding out. Uh, that that was one of the causes um, and there, there was a, a relation there but it definitely hits home I mean you don't want to use that as the the driver to get people vaccinated but I I suppose if people are waking up a little more and realizing the severity for young kids if, if that helps them kind of come to that realization then then all the better but um, that was a, obviously a very tough story and you know we just just feel terrible for the family that has to go through that Governor, with regard to the strike teams where are we in terms of getting them into the Process. Yeah, I think the same process. A few, I think we're probably sometime after the holidays. We're still a few weeks out. Again, it's it's a matter of contracting with the private contractor, bringing folks in from uh, other parts of the country, uh, most for the most part. Um, but I, I don't think I think we're still on track to, to have them in in the next few weeks. What's that? Early January. Oh, early January. So yeah, just a few weeks out, hopefully, which is great. And that'll be another another part of the process. So. Do we know with kids, do we know where the level of spread is in schools these days? And if kids, should kids be wearing masks all the time and should we be spreading them out again like we were doing earlier on? So again, the, the level of spread in school today is, is you know, it, it tracks similarly with what we're seeing with COVID everywhere. Um, you know, with this winter surge, uh, it is definitely surging in schools. Um, I think schools overall have done a fantastic job uh, because schools, I think, entered even September before the surge prepared to, to use some of those tools and strategies that Dr. Chan put together for them uh, late last year. Uh, they were able to carry some of those strategies forward, whether it be social distancing or mass if they want to choose to do mass or how they have lunch or whatever it might be, but still make sure the kids are in school with that academic opportunity, with the socialization. And I think overall, we, we've seen clusters here and there with, in, in schools. Um, we've had a 
few issues, one or two issues, where I think some teacher outbreaks have kind of pushed the, you know, there weren't enough teachers really to come in, but by and large those teachers, you know, recovered and, and back in into class, which means the students were back into class, and that was all a very positive mix. So I, I think schools have done a fantastic job and have been a great model for how to do it without having to shut everything down, how to put a lot of these pieces in place that uh, that Swiss cheese effect uh, that Dr. Chan talks about, all these different pieces that can really help mitigate the spread and, and keep kids in. Again, you see clusters here and there, two or three kids out in that classroom, two or three kids out in that, that classroom, and eventually, for the most part, they, they roll back in. Uh, they get better and they come back in. And um, Schools are, are managing it pretty darn well. We have some sure, questions Governor. online? Uh, yeah, you do have a couple folks on the line with questions, and your first one comes from Kathy McCormick with the Associated Press. Mm -hmm. Kathy, please go ahead with your question. Hi, thank you. Uh, I want connection for a minute, so forgive me if I missed something on this. Uh, I know there will be more uh, free home COVID test kits available and that there will continue to be a heavy emphasis on home testing, but there will be so many of those kits and, and pharmacies are starting to limit the numbers they sell now. Are you considering expanding the fixed vaccination sites to also include COVID testing or perhaps create more test sites? So the question is, are we going to fix or create more fixed test sites? Uh, I, I can honestly tell you, we have more flexible testing opportunities in New Hampshire than anywhere in America. Uh, and I'm very proud of that. Uh, the first at-home testing push was very successful. As of tomorrow, you're going to be able to go online and there'll be another 750,000 tests uh, put out there uh, to another 80,000 homes. And to put some of those numbers in perspective, if you look at 1.75 million tests that will be put out or from between last week and this week, uh, on a given day, uh, on average, people are looking to do 12, 10 to 12,000 tests a day, maybe even more. Let's say it's 15,000 tests a day. Um, so if that rate were to, were to continue or even get increased to 20,000 tests a day, you're looking at weeks and weeks and weeks worth of tests that, we've, that we are putting out into communities in folks' homes. And then obviously you can still go get tested at, at some of the other, you know, at, at pharmacies or doctor's offices, whatever it might be. Um, that's obviously take, still taking a, a large part of, of the burden of testing, especially around PCR tests. So when it comes to the average number of people that are looking for a test, uh, we've put, you know, months worth, frankly, of tests out there, uh, which creates a, an immense amount of flexibility. So if we were to create, my point in bringing all that home is that if we were to create fixed sites, we're going to do it as we are now around boosters and vaccinations, and that's where we're likely going to try to maximize our healthcare workforce in terms of creating walk-up opportunities for individuals to get boosted or get their vac vaccination. That's really where I think the, the, um, there's still opportunities to increase our capacity. Testing, I'm not um, ignoring the issue, but I think we've just knocked it out of the park in terms of creating opportunity. I can tell you 49 other states would love to be where we are with our, with our testing flexibility right now. And Governor, your next question comes from Allie Pham with New Hampshire Public Radio. Allie, please go ahead with your question. All right, thank you. I've actually got three today, so bear with me and thank you for answering them all. My first one is um, for Dr. Chan. So recently the federal government <coughs> guidance that um, an mRNA series is preferred over the Johnson and Johnson vaccine came out and top health officials have been saying that to be fully vaccinated ideally means having three shots. So how should granted staters who maybe only receive two shots, a Johnson and Johnson for a shot and a booster, kind of think about their protection in light of this changing evidence? So it's my first one for Dr. Chan. And then uh, my second question is that um, Governor Sununu, as you mentioned, our hospital system has been receiving support from federal teams, um, and you mentioned it's still kind of unclear if we'll be getting those additional teams you requested. Um, and if those don't come through, what is your plan to provide that kind of acute support for the hospital system? And then my third question is, we've been told that the New Hampshire Hospital Association supplies daily updates to the state on COVID-19 hospital information, on, sorry, on COVID-19 hospitalization, including information on whether or not the people hospitalized for COVID-19 are vaccinated. And I'm wondering if you could tell us more about the information you're collecting from the hospitals, how long you've been gathering it, and um, 
why those metrics are not being um, shared with the public. Thank you. Okay, Dr. Jean, do you want to talk first about the difference between the mRNA versus Johnson Johnson plus a booster? Yeah, I'm thank curious as to what you're going to say, too. Because <laughs> <laughs> I'm in the second group. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, thanks for the question about the mRNA vaccines, meaning the Pfizer or the Moderna vaccines versus the Janssen vaccine. Um, and, and you're absolutely right. The um, CDC end of last week came out with a recommendation, a preferential recommendation, um, recommending the Pfizer or the Moderna vaccines over the J and J uh, Janssen vaccine. The reason for that preferential recommendation was not because the Janssen vaccine doesn't work. Um, the reason for that preferential recommendation was because of some of the risks um, that have been found with the Janssen vaccine, specifically the thrombosis uh, with thrombocytis thrombocytopenia syndrome, thrombosis with thrombocytopenia syndrome, or TTS, uh, that was identified um, very early on last this past spring after um, rollout of the Janssen vaccine that, that caused the, the pause, I think, back in April. Um, so this is not a new risk, but uh, what has been found is that there has been some continuing rare occurrence of uh, TTS, or thrombosis with thrombocytopenia syndrome, um, despite the pause that happened last spring, uh, and and these um, rare occurrences of TTS have um, occurred not only in um, females in their 30s and 40s, which were the and still are the highest risk group for developing TTS, but they found that the risk of TTS existed in, in other age groups in females and also in males. So that was the reason um, for the preferential recommendation of the Moderna or the Pfizer vaccine over the J and J Janssen vaccine. It's not because the J and J or the Janssen vaccine doesn't have effectiveness against preventing COVID-19 or hospitalizations or, or deaths. Um, regarding your question about people that may have received the Janssen vaccine, um, the number of doses that somebody can receive uh, is dependent on which vaccine they got for their primary series. So for right now, if somebody started their vaccination with the Janssen vaccine, um, the number of doses that they are recommended and able to get are two, right? The single dose primary series followed by a booster at least two months later. For the people that started their vaccination series with either the Pfizer or the Moderna vaccines, uh, those individuals are able to get three, maybe four vaccines, um, uh, four vaccines if they're moderately or severely immunocompromised, right? Um, so these are different vaccines. They have different um, authorizations, different recommendations for how they are used. And so for somebody that has already gotten the Janssen vaccine and already taken the step of getting the booster dose, um, that's it for now. There's no other doses of the vaccine that, that are recommended. Um, but I think it, it does highlight the importance of people getting the booster dose, right? So if you got two doses of the Pfizer vaccine or two doses of the Moderna vaccine or the single dose Janssen vaccine already, everybody 16 and over should get a booster dose. Um, again, because of the emerging evidence showing that those booster doses will be needed uh, against the Omicron variant. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Very informative. Um, so I believe your second question, Ali, was about the acute uh, care support um, that we have received already from FEMA uh, through our previous conversations. And now hopefully we could receive some more based on what the president was discussing yesterday. It still remains to be seen whether they'll come. Um, clearly, I, I guess I would answer, I think the question is what if it doesn't come? What, what else are we looking to do to help take some of the burden off of our health care system? Uh, I would go back a little bit and talk about some of the things we've pu already put into place that cl clearly are working, right? So we fast track licensure for um, hundreds of nurses um, and, and frontline uh, individuals that can work in, in, in hospitals to help uh, either allow more folks to be in a bed that might otherwise have gone empty or, or give a break, frankly, to a lot of the, the frontline workers that are out there. So fast-tracking the licensure has been a hugely successful piece. Um, fast-tracking the Medicaid payments and those guaranteed Medicaid payments to the long-term care providers so individuals are moving out of the emergency rooms and, and, and beds within the hospital to long-term care has already been uh, fairly successful. We are going to absolutely keep doing that. Today we authorized another $10 million to hospitals uh, based on their bed count um, to, uh, again, allow, give them a, a few more resources so they can compete a little bit uh, better in terms of bringing in some of these, either their own strike teams. We have, our, we have a strike team coming, strike teams coming in as well to long-term care to help that, but maybe bringing their own strike, strike teams or 
um, the traveling nurse program, which can be a very expensive program for hospitals, but also a very valuable tool, especially when you can draw off of some of the southern states that don't currently have um, the, the high rates of COVID uh, just yet. Uh, also, the men and women of the National Guard, they've been phenomenal. We uh, deployed 70 individuals about a week ago. We're putting more individuals out there to help with our booster sites and some of our vaccine sites, and we still have more men and women that we can draw upon. Um, and what they're really designed to do in the hospital system is do a lot of that back-end administrative, uh, those administrative tasks, um, so that everyone can kind of get bumped up in terms of a responsibility and opportunity within the hospitals and it just helps flex and loosen up some of those individuals and some of those hospitals in terms of the demand that they're putting on their own staff and so we can always uh, potentially increase the men and women of the National Guard if we have to uh, down the road so I think there's there's a lot of other pieces there but uh, and then the best thing to do is make sure that you don't have the high hospitalizations that you're really addressing it in a preventative way that you're providing the testing out there so folks can know that they may be positive earlier a little more often and uh, and they can take the right precautions for them themselves their families and their communities um, so it's it's a there's a it, it's a big puzzle to be sure but I think we've put as as many innovative uh, pieces in place to take the burden off our hospital system as any state in the country doesn't mean that we're out of it but it definitely means that we and we've already seen some positive results which is good but we got to stay with it and we got to keep giving it 110 percent uh, and at least until we come out of this this uh, winter surge which hopefully will be in the next in the next couple of weeks we'll see some some consistent downward pressure uh, on the system which uh, could be an opportunity uh, Commissioner Shibinette do you have any information on the I think the question on vaccinated unvaccinated and hospitalization so Ali I think your question was on the the report or the data that the hospital sends to us uh, each day um, and how long we've received it and what's on it and why aren't we releasing it publicly so historically you know this report started off um, as a PPE report um, it was how many boxes of gloves they had and how many um, gowns they had and what they needed and that type of thing and that's that's how the hospital report started and I think over the last two years it's he evolved to have more information on it um, currently it has detailed information on it about hospitalizations about vaccination status and things like that um, you typically when we're at press conferences or at public meetings and I get asked questions around vaccination status of people that are hospitalized or number of people in the hospital uh, you know I can verbally release that information um, we have had recent requests to release the entire report and what I can tell you is that I'm, I'm having conversations with the hospital association now um, to really look at whether you know what we can include in a public release of that report because th th some of the details could could allow for constructive identification of a person right if you have a 20 or a 25 bed hospital and you have one pediatric case in that hospital in a small rural area you're going to be able to constructively identify so really working with the hospital systems to find out to really uh, look at that report and say what can we release publicly every day so that so that um, we don't constructively identify but we give the public what they're looking for most of the things on that hospital report that can be public really publicly released um, we talk about at every press conference and almost at every public meeting thank you phones are all set sir great governor what's if anything is anything keeping you up at night these days really Sometimes I, uh, I make the joke, but I'm serious. I feel like Charlie Brown. I got to give Lucy five cents and just download stuff. A um, little bit of everything, to be honest. Um, we try to focus on the holidays and the gratitude. And people know that I try to stay on the positive side of everything. But there's no doubt this surge is very real. There's no doubt there is, I think, um, an extreme hesitancy by a certain amount of the population to get vaccinated. And I mean, we put the messaging out. We try every creative way we possibly can. Uh, to get the message out to, so uh, folks can tell their own stories to hopefully encourage other people to get vaccinated. Uh, but there's, there's a lot of hesitancy in that you know, minority population there. Um, but that population is clearly the vast number of cases that are, that are the most severe. Um, you know, one thing we're looking at is ways to, so folks, if they're willing to step up and tell their story, where they, they, you know, we've, heard, we've heard a lot of it anecdotally. But to have that family, if you will, get out there and get on a television commercial and say, yeah, I didn't get vaccinated. I didn't think it was going to affect me. Next thing I knew, my, my husband was you know, in the ICU for three and a half weeks, and we couldn't even visit. And what that does to families, it's, it's harsh, and it's real. It's really real. I've walked those ICU halls. It's scary. 
Those are this, a lot of the same individuals that just aren't going anywhere for a long time. And unfortunately, we know a lot of those people are in induced comas and they won't wake up. And that's a reality for a lot of families that are struggling right now, today, knowing that they have individuals. They didn't think they were going to be there a couple months ago, but boy, they're there today. And so I think the number one thing is, you know, whatever we can do to get people to realize how important the vaccine and the booster is, that's the way out of this, of course. Um, you know, we, we have a strong economy right now. We have a lot of opportunity right now. We're very fortunate uh, here in New Hampshire compared to most states in many, many different ways. But that's probably the number one thing that, that keeps me up. And just uh, the misinformation, too. It really drives a lot of us crazy, I think, because I, I, I don't want to speak for the commissioner and, and Dr. Chan and, in fact, Lee, um, Trish Tilly and the entire team over at Public Health that do a phenomenal job putting out data. People know how data-driven I am, and I'm insistent that the data be real and accurate. Um, but there's just so much cons consistent misinformation out there, and I, tell, I try to encourage people, don't watch social media. Nothing's real on social media, unless you're watching my posts. But, no, but, I mean, it's just, you know, these are these are the individuals that you can trust your doctor is who you can trust your pharmacist is who you can trust if you want to really know what's happening out there but the amount of misinformation i would say is also uh, very very disconcerting and again we just try to push back on it as calmly and clearly as we possibly can and just tell folks if you're if you're looking at these press conferences and you're not buying what we're saying for some reason by all means pick up the phone to your doctor pick up your phone to to someone that you do trust because um, it's so clear about what's happening in our system i'm sorry to go on with the long answer but i I'll give you the nickel in the, in the can later. What else do you guys got? Governor, Kev? with regard to vaccine mandates, as you know, the legal landscape right now is all over the place. Some all courts are saying it's legal, some are saying it's not. It's, it may be okay for companies with 100 or more employees. It's not right now for healthcare workers in New Hampshire and some other states. How do companies, organizations plan for the future, given this thing could be up in the air for weeks, if not months? That's a great question. So the question, uh, for those who didn't hear, is really about all the different types of vaccine mandates, specifically out of Washington, the government-driven uh, vaccine mandates. Um, some are, are moving forward. Some are being upheld uh, in the uh, are being uh, stopped in the courts. Some that were stopped in the courts are now being moving forward in the courts. Um, so it gets massively confusing for, for a lot of the businesses out there. If I might take a step back and just say the number one reason why the federal government shouldn't have gotten involved in government-driven mandates in the first place. They had to have known these were going to get held up in, in potential injunctions in the courts. They had to know that these businesses that can barely find any workers in the first place were going to be struggling just to figure this system out. And again, it's I really think it's a symptom of not understanding what's happening on the ground. Washington is this isolated place. They do tabletop exercises. It sounds good on paper, but they really don't have any connection to what it's doing to a lot of these business owners. To the point you just made, I've heard in the past 48 hours in particular, a lot of business owners saying, where are we with the mandate? So there's a couple. You have the OSHA mandate, which is a, any business of 100 people or more to, or need, needs to be vaccinated according to the federal government. That was stopped in a federal court. And then another court vacated stopping it. And so technically that's moving forward. And I think that's the number one uh, mandate out there that is very confusing. Technically, it's moving forward. Um, I think the, the Supreme Court is likely to take it up in the next week or two before it has to, before kind of the end date comes. And hopefully they'll, they'll put a pause to it again and give them, give everybody time for them to hear the arguments on both sides. I can't say that with any assurity, but hopefully they'll do that. Um, I know a lot of businesses out there. I'm not advising one thing or the other. I'm not a lawyer. I'm not going to get in, in that game. But I can tell you a lot of businesses have said, look, we're not getting rid of everybody. You know, there's a certain amount of our population of employees that just aren't going to get vaccinated. We'll wait for the federal government to come knocking on our door uh, to tell us that, you know, we really did something wrong because having those employees is so important. Um, and, and they'll kind of play the risk game a little bit with the uncertainty. There's a federal contractor mandate that has now, I believe, been paused by the courts at the very last minute, again, creating a lot of confusion in the system. Um, so, uh, you know, it's been paused. It is a temporary injunction on that. Whether that goes forward or not uh, remains to be seen. I, I'm not advising one thing or the other, but I think a lot of businesses are going to take a wait and see attitude before they start telling employees they have they can't work for them anymore um, because there's so much confusion. And um, hopefully the Supreme Court will jump in on this stuff quickly and sort it all out because at this point, um, this is one of those things where, um, I mean, I want the flexibility. As you know, I don't believe in, in government-driven mandates on vaccines. But um, 
clarity and certainty is way more important one way or the other to these businesses than anything because they, they don't want to run the risk of getting fined and penalized, but they also don't want to tell employees they can't work for them and then find out two weeks later that the rule that drove them to get rid of an employee couldn't have been enforced anyways, right? And so it's massively confusing and we, I don't want to say give them, I, I'm not here to do the I told you so, but this is stuff that really could have been predicted. The confusion over this could have been predicted a long time ago and I wish Washington had taken a, I think a, a more sober approach to, um, to how to go about this. Okay. Great. Well, look, we want everyone, um, uh, we're uh, not sure if we'll be back next week. We're going to kind of see where the numbers go. We know it's the holidays and all that. Uh, but one way or the other, Christmas is here. For those who are celebrating Christmas, we want everyone to have a very Merry Christmas. Uh, be smart, be safe, but enjoy time with family. Um, COVID could be with us for a long time. We know that. But, um, you know, things in 22 are a little, definitely a little better than they, or 21 were a little better than they were in 20. And uh, I have no doubt things in 22 will even, even get better. But we have to stay vigilant. We can't become complacent. Um, vaccines and boosters and testing and all those basics. There's nothing new here. All those basics are just so important to maintain the health of your family, the flexibility in our healthcare system. Um, but with all that that's happening, I think the team here, I can't thank them enough. They're doing a phenomenal job at the state level. I think everyone owes a huge debt of gratitude to the individuals I have the honor of working with because they're the ones that are making uh, Christmas a little brighter for a lot of people and a little more flexible and a little more open. So whatever you guys can do to spend some time and enjoy time with family in a safe way, we just wish everyone the best this coming week. Thank you guys.